Okay, students, good evening. Welcome. I noticed we are now lecture 20. That seems like a big number. So we've come a fair way into the uh, course. So where are we? We've been uh, looking at the practice side of things of reinforcement learning uh, starting the last few weeks. So, I mean, post mid semester, it has basically been learning, starting with uh, Monte Carlo methods, then bootstrapping. And then we went from um, essentially that world of policy evaluation and so on in a tabular setting to um, function approximation where you have to generalize. We did a couple of lectures on function approximation before we uh, declared that there are issues with it. Um, it can diverge and so on, right? And it might not be of independent interest to approximate Q values when they don't give you good policies. And last class, we looked especially at policy search methods, saying that let's assume that the parameters we have are the parameters of our policy. Let's try and find parameter values that maximize the uh, value associated with the policy if it's suitably defined. And we used, we called it at that point black box optimization. Um, this lecture today is dedicated to the more mathematical uh, uh, oriented discussion of the same thing. It's called policy gradient methods. Uh, it, it is a form of policy search, you can say. It's an instance of policy search. But there is some nice um, uh, a mathematical understanding of how it works, why it works. So that's what it is, policy gradient methods. And uh, I mean, that will be the big main section. Uh, there's a small twist to it called variance reduction, which will just take 10 minutes. So that we will see. And then policy gradient methods are the building blocks of something called actor critic methods. You should know what it is. So parts two and three will be relatively small. The main mathematical derivation is in uh, section one. But before we go into that, why? Why should we be studying policy gradient methods other than the fact that it's a part of your syllabus? Um, because it's, uh, it's, it's something that's very versatile. It's got a large number of practical applications, OK? Um, so I've just listed a few illustrative uh, ones. So yeah, so we will, we will be looking at a particular, the, the canonical policy graded method is called reinforce. OK, that's what we'll be looking at. And exactly reinforce is what is used in Moody and Saffel's uh, paper, which is one of the pioneering works on um, RL for trading. OK, you have money in the stock market. You want to buy and sell, right? How do you tweak your policy in response to data? so that you make more money, okay? That's what's discussed in that paper. It uses the method that we're gonna study in the next two minutes. Um, Jan Peters, who's in Europe, um, in Switzerland, I think, uh, has, uh, I mean, over a long period, uh, demonstrated in multiple different ways the applicability of policy graded methods for robotic tasks. If you can parameterize policies, I mean, how do you go and grasp an object, lift it, and so on? Right? Do you learn that by Q learning? Is it more natural to learn it using other methods? So policy gradient methods, actor critic methods, different variations of these. Uh, I don't know, there's 15, 20 years of papers coming from um, Jan Peters. Uh, there is a lot more also happening uh, recently. So you've already seen two very different applications. One is trading, one is uh, robotics. Um, we will cover AlphaGo, I think, uh, before the semester closes. Um, so we'll see the application of policy gradient methods in greater depth uh, when we do it. But one of the multiple ingredients that go into um, Go, right, programs that play against each other, right, and then learn from that experience um, is policy gradient methods, okay? So AlphaGo also uses Reinforce. Uh, thereafter, it has been um, uh, superseded by other things, but uh, it, it's still there, okay? It's very um, in, 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 in integral to what uh, was done originally. Uh, this I just picked up while making the slides this afternoon. Um, so this is not like one particular application, but this is a survey, okay? This is a survey article of the use of reinforcement learning for autonomous navigation, okay? This, you know, is a big industry. Uh, it's already taken off in the West. People uh, in India are trying to catch up. So how do you train a, um, a car, right? An autonomous vehicle to navigate based on what it senses, what it sees. Uh, I mean, there are literally, I don't know, 100 different methods you can run. Policy graded methods have been used uh, to some uh, good effect also there. This paper is good, by the way. I mean, um, I would actually recommend this 
uh, survey here as a sort of uh, summary of various things we've covered. Okay, not only policy gradient methods, but it sort of puts reinforcement learning in a nice perspective from the point of view of making this application work, autonomous navigation. Okay, so uh, I mean, I could go on, okay, I only have space for four, um, I don't know, applications on this slide, but uh, policy gradient methods are very ubiquitous, okay, people, a lot of practitioners use them, and so you should definitely know what they are, um, uh, what is the basis for policy gradient methods. So now we'll get into the actual um, uh, illustration, the mathematical understanding of what they are. So now for simplicity, we are starting with a bandit type of setup, okay, there is no state, okay. There are two actions, there's actions A1 and A2 uh, in this world. Uh, if you <coughs> take action A1, you get a reward of five. If you take action A2, you get a reward of 10. But it so happens you are following a policy pi, okay? So pi will basically tell you which action you're going to take. Um, turns out that this pi is parameterized by this number theta, okay? So and here's how pi works. If this input parameter theta is less than 0 0.6, then um, it's going to take, uh, okay, I've, the way I have um, used notation pi of A1 means it's a probability with which this policy pi is going to take A1, right? It's going to take um, A1, right? If theta is less than 0 0.6, if theta is greater than or equal to 0 0.6, it's going to take A2, right? It's got to take one of these two actions. Um, Okay, so this is just saying one probability of A1, zero probability of A2, if theta is less than 0 0.6, the other way around. So if theta is greater than or equal to 0 0.6, you'll take A2, okay? That's, that's what pi is uh, doing. So now, if we ask what is the value of uh, pi, right? Now clearly if pi is taking always A2, the value is 10, um, okay, let's assume it's, it's just one step, okay? There's no um, long term and so on and uh, uh, if it's taking the other action, A1, the reward is five. More, if you want to write this down in a, in a uni unified uh, way, so I'm saying that the value associated with theta, J is going to stand for value, like a scalar number associated with how good your policy is throughout this uh, talk today. So I'm saying that is pi of A1 times five plus pi of A2 times 10. This policy, of course, is deterministic, but more generally, you could, you could mix these in uh, some convex combination. Okay, so what I've drawn here is just drawn the graphs of these things. So uh, as you vary theta on the x-axis, here is how pi itself varies. For theta less than what's the discontinuity here is at 0 0.6, right? So at 0 0.6 uh, on the left it is taking one, uh, it is taking A1, right? And on the uh, right it is taking A2. And over here is J of theta, okay? So it's going to be either five or 10 depending on whether you're this side of 0.6 or that side of 0.6. So far, so good. This understanding what's going on. Now, contrast pi with a policy pi prime. Okay, pi prime qualitatively is like pi, but mathematically is slightly different. Okay, so pi prime, the probability of taking A1, right, under pi prime, <coughs> which is also parameterized by theta, is like a sigmoid, okay? It is one over one plus e to the theta minus 0 0.6. Okay, so uh, I mean what this means is if theta is 0 0.6, right, the probability is going to be half. And uh, as theta becomes larger, 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 you get one over one plus e to the theta, which becomes like closer and closer to zero, right? And as theta becomes what a minus infinity, here you get um, um, one, right? And so that's what you're seeing on this, right? This is how pi prime varies. I mean, it, it is similarly, it is similar to pi when theta is very small and very large, but close to this um, uh, place where it shifts, where it uh, switches, it is smooth, right? It, it sort of starts slowly coming down here and then it, it converges to the other value. Uh, okay, now if you see J of theta, similarly, it is going to be pi prime times pi plus pi prime A2 times 10. It's again going to look like J of theta, but it is uh, varying smoothly. So that is all we have seen as the, I mean, this is a simple setup, okay? There is no state, nothing. Um, there are these two different policies, both parameterized by theta. One is doing it discontinuously. The other one is doing it gradually. Which do you think uh, might have some uh, advantage for us to go with? What do you normally see in machine learning? J or J prime or pi or pi prime? 
What's the property that pi prime has that uh, pi doesn't have? Continuity and more so is differentiable, okay? Based on this, you should be able to say that you can actually differentiate pi prime. So what, I mean, when we're doing reinforcement learning, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find parameter values that give us high, uh, high scale or high, high values, right? So that value is j here. And if you just look at this, it looks like this j function here is differentiable with respect to theta. Right? And so if it is differentiable with respect to theta, we know that we can use this uh, approach of going up the gradient, right? You actually calculate the differential, right? And then take steps in the direction that J is increasing. That is like a standard methodology that we use in machine learning and optimization. We've already done it a few times. We did it for uh, gradient descent when we did, I think, the TD uh, method. So the idea of having a differentiable J seems uh, attractive. So Let's see whether this same concept carries forward to the more, um, uh, I don't know, full-fledged uh, situation where you have an MDP, right? You have states and so on. So, yeah, but this is the idea, okay? We've already seen the idea. If pi is differentiable with respect to theta, okay? Pi, if the policy is differentiable with respect to theta, that's what we saw over here. The policy is differentiable with respect to theta. The claim is that j, right, of that theta is also differentiable with respect to theta, okay? We will, we will prove that, I mean, that, that will come out very clearly, uh, very shortly. So if this is the case, what we can do is we can find better and better thetas by going up this gradient of j, okay? You start with some theta, right, and you know that gradient of j with respect to theta, right, and so you want that to increase, right? You start taking steps in the direction that is uh, increasing your um, j value. Um, I mean, uh, you, this is just an example, right? There's multiple ways in which you can set up your policy. But one very common one is um, you set up your policy as a softmax policy uh, with, with like a linear um, uh, combination of features. So what's going on here? For every state action pair, okay? Let's say that we have a feature vector x. This is exactly like we did when we did function approximation. So x is, let's say, a d-dimensional um, uh, feature vector then what we can do is we can dot product x with theta, okay? Theta is also, let's say, a d-dimensional vector. That's our parameter vector for this policy. But we have to say, I mean, how do you take actions, right, based on theta? So we are going to say that the probability that you will take action A from state S is proportional to e to the theta dot producted with x of S A. So we have the feature vector dot producted with theta and um, do the softmax, right? Softmax means or the probability with which you take is e to the theta dot x of s a, whatever, and then you normalize it by doing the same thing for all the other uh, actions, okay? You sum it up over all the other actions because we are uh, doing this for this particular state. You need, it needs to be a probability distribution for each state. Um, this is okay? So I think it was, last time it was something like, uh, well, last time actually we didn't, uh, we didn't do the softmax, we used the sigmoid, which can probably be written down in this form, I think. I'm not 100% sure. But this is a more uh, gen standard generic way of uh, doing it. Turns out that if you do it in this particular way, right, if this is how your pi depends on theta, then if you calculate the gradient of pi, so if, if pi is a function of theta, then there is a function called gradient of pi, right? That's also a function of theta. So what is that function? You will see that this is how it uh, uh, turns out. It's going to be x. So gradient, by the way, is a vector. Okay, so if you have d parameters, gradient will give you one number for each of those uh, parameters. So what is the gradient vector here? It's a feature vector minus a linear combination of these feature vectors, whole thing times pi of s a. Okay, this is that uh, probability with which you're taking action a from status. You can just do the differentiation and uh, uh, get this. Okay, so. What we have just said with this example is if you have a pi that depends on theta in this uh, particular way, then the gradient of pi, uh, I mean, there is a closed form formula mathematically, right? Analytically, you can do the working out, right? And see that this is how it uh, shows up. But I mean, the question is, why are we asking about the gradient of pi when actually what we are trying to go up is the gradient of j, right? j depends on theta, right? And we want to find tweak theta so that j increases. I've taken, I don't know, five minutes to tell you that um, if pi depends in this particular way on theta, then pi's gradient uh, looks like this as a function of uh, uh, theta. Okay, 
Um, yeah, by the way, so I mean, um, pi here, I'm, I'm not, okay, I'll say this again, but see, pi here is a function of theta. I've not explicitly said that pi is a function of theta, but I've left it implicit. So this is a pi that depends on theta. This pi also depends on theta, right? So there is a dependence everywhere on um, theta. Yeah, but the point is, um, what is, um, if, if our aim is to go up the gradient of j, right? Why are we uh, looking at the gradient of pi? Okay, I'll give you the answer to that question, but uh, anything from you so far? Yeah. Chain rule, uh, yeah, we'll do more than chain rule. We'll do, we'll do something called policy gradient theorem, which has enough chain rule. Oh, you mean to calculate this? This is, yeah, this is just the gradient of pi. Over here, you're saying you could use the chain rule. Yeah, we'll see. You, you need to be, do more than that, actually. Remember, we are in the learning setting, okay? We're not doing planning. We don't have access to transition properties, rewards, and so on directly. We can only get them by sampling. Okay, so the connection between the gradient of j and the gradient of pi is the policy gradient theorem. Okay, and we are going to derive this theorem. In order to do it, we are going to make life a little bit uh, simpler just so that there's no notational clutter and so on. So let's assume our task is episodic, right, which means when you start, right, at some point you will stop. Let's not worry about the discount factor because we've made this episodic assumption, we can just assume gamma is one. If you use gamma less than one, it'll show up in various places in the uh, uh, equations, okay. Uh, Sutton and Barto has it, right, so we can, if you want, you can generalize, let's, let's just do it, right, and at later point, you, you can fill up the gammas uh, wherever they apply. Let's assume that there is a fixed start state S0, okay. This is the, uh, I mean, we normally use the superscript for time, right, so at time step zero, let us say that S0 is fixed, okay, to some state um, that you start at. We are not going to keep writing pi theta everywhere. It's, it's implicit everywhere, okay, that pi is a policy that's parameterized by theta. And let us uh, um, follow the convention that the scalar value, right, the theta we are trying to uh, optimize for is something that should maximize j of theta defined to be the value of S0. We're starting at the state, start state, right? We want to find a pi that's going to give us the highest value starting at this start state. Um, so originally, what do you say? You give me a policy that's optimal for all states, right? So all that is now gone because, uh, I mean, we are having like a representation using features and so on, right? There's no guarantee that we are, we are going to be able to uh, find a policy that's optimal for all the states, right? But what we would like to do is do our best in terms of maximizing J of theta, defined to be the value just for this start state under pi. And the policy gradient theorem is precisely the statement that um, that says what is the connection between gradient of j and gradient of pi. Okay. All right. So policy gradient uh, uh, theorem. We are going to derive this now. So remember that j of theta is v pi of s zero. Okay. We are going to do a derivation for for general uh, s. Okay. Not necessarily s zero. And then we'll come back to a particular uh, uh, state S0. So uh, what is V pi of S? V pi of S can be written as sum over actions pi of S A Q pi of S A. Okay, uh, I mean this is this is just like the, whatever, you, you write down the Bellman equations or something, right? This is what it'll show up. So gradient of V pi of S is gradient of this, okay? Now, what is gradient of uh, x times y? It's the product rule, right? It's gradient of x times y plus uh, x times gradient of y. It's summed up over all actions. So, but, but that's basically what we're doing, okay? The first step is to say that this quantity here can be expressed as a sum of two gradients. First, sum over actions gradient of pi times q pi sa, the second time, pi of SA times gradient of Q pi SA. But now let's write down what Q pi of SA is. It is sum over S prime, T of SA, S prime, R of SA, S prime plus, okay, forget the gamma, okay? Uh, there's no gamma here because we chose not to discount, times uh, V pi of S prime. 
Okay, what have I done? I've just written down gradient of product as uh, sum of two gradients um, and written out what is q pi of SA. Okay, so I've just written this out uh, um, in, in sort of expanded form. Now, um, tell me a little bit about the second term. Okay, we're looking at the gradient with respect to theta of sum over S prime of T times R plus V pi. Okay. So can you tell me something about uh, this quantity so that it gets simplified? Sorry? Yeah, right, so the T times R is not really a function of theta, right? So the gradient of that with respect to theta is zero. So all we are left with is T times V pi, right? We have to take the gradient of that because V pi does depend on uh, theta. So let's just now collect these two things together. The first, uh, comes in exactly as it is, sum over actions, gradient of pi times q, plus um, what's going on here, pi of SA times, uh, yeah, T doesn't actually depend on uh, theta, right? It's like multiplying constant, sum over S prime, T of SA, S prime, gradient of V pi of S prime. Okay, now take a small, uh, I don't know, breath and try and uh, see what's going on over here. Does this remind you of, uh, Bellman equations, yes, it usually does, okay, because here we, are, we have a gradient of V pi of S expressed in terms of various things and then again gradient of V pi of S prime, okay. So what should we do, should we, should we solve for gradient of V pi of S prime like we did with Bellman equations? Sorry? Let's assume S is not too large. <laughs> there are more fundamental problems than the size of S. We can use linear what? Okay. What about this? There's a gradient with respect to theta of pi of S A. Uh, okay. Okay. What about Q pi of SA? What about T of SA is prime? We're not doing planning. Okay. So early on, right, the objective was given an MDP, right? You can do what computation you want to calculate its value function. There it was linear, you could solve it, get the answer, right? But here, we are not trying to, uh, I mean, if you already knew what Q pi of SA was, right? Uh, you, you could just take an action that is maximizing that or something like that. Like we don't know these things. We're still doing our derivation. Yes, there is this kind of uh, recurrent uh, relationship between B, gradient of V pi expressed in terms of various gradients of uh, V pi, but we can't really solve this in some kind of planning way. That's not what we're trying to do. We'll have to do some more derivation from here, but already notice there's a pattern that is emerging, okay? So the LHS is what? Gradient of V pi of S. That, it turns out, is a sum over actions of gradient of pi Q pi of S A, okay, this is one term, plus, now there is something multiplying this gradient of V pi of S prime, right? Consider any V pi of S prime. What is the coefficient multiplying it? It is a sum over actions of pi of S A, sum over S prime T of S A S prime. Right? That is what is multiplying V pi of S prime. Does that quantity stand for something qualitatively, right? What, what would that, what, what quantity is equal to the sum over actions pi of S A, the sum over next states T of S A S prime? Expected value of? Yeah, so if you remove this, right, what is this uh, uh, probability? What is this quantity? Exactly, right, it is the probability of going from S to S prime by taking A, which is what you're taking anyway, right? So you're at S, suppose, suppose I asked you a question or something like that, right? What is the probability that you'll be in S prime after one step if you took A? So it's got to be pi of S A, uh, multiplying, well, what is the sum over S primes? Uh, 
Uh, okay, so we are looking at a particular S prime. Okay, I'm sorry if I asked to, if I sort of included the sum here. Suppose we're looking at a particular S prime. Uh, what is multiplying it is pi of S a times T of S a S prime. Summed up over all actions. Okay, this sum is there. So pi of S a might be taking different actions. Okay, so with some probability you're taking this action, some probability you're taking this action, and from because of that, with some probability you're going to one S prime, one something else, but then. With T of S A S prime, right? If you accumulate this over all the actions, that's the probability with which you're coming to S prime, right? So, what we have right now, after just one step of doing this, is that the gradient of V pi of S is some over actions. This, which seems like some kind of atomic term, plus you you continue to get this gradient again back, but now it is multiplied by the probability of being at S prime. Okay, now. Imagine now starting with this S prime and then doing the same expansion again. Okay, if, if instead of just leaving it like this, we, we did this same expansion that we did the first time for each S prime, right? What will you get? You will get this probability multiplying similarly uh, this atomic term, right? G gradient of pi times Q pi now for the S prime. And now the probability for the S double primes of being in those S double primes after two steps, um, right? By taking a from state S, right, and then acting again according to pi from the next state S prime. And then you keep doing that. The general form that you will get is this, okay. It is going to uh, turn out to be a sum over states. So let's say X is uh, states, a sum over time, uh, T. This quantity here, P of S to X T pi, okay, that's shorthand for the probability of being at state x after t steps by following pi if you had started at state s. Okay, you start at s, what's the probability you'll be in pi, in x after t steps if you're following pi, right? That probability uh, multiplied by this atomic term over here, okay? It gets, gets uh, each time for, for, for a particular state. See, this thing only depends on a state, right? So every time a state gets visited sometime somewhere inside this expansion, it's going to contribute this term, right? And what is the amount of mass that is multiplying it? It is uh, a sum over all time of the probability of being in that state by, um, at that time step by following pi starting at state s. Okay, we've seen this just for the first time step. You can do it uh, one more for second time step, right? And then you see the pattern. Uh, this is how it is going to uh, show up. This is not the policy gradient theorem yet. Um, in fact, it is actually, right? We can uh, write this down more succinctly, but uh, I mean, this is not the full story with the policy gradient theorem. Right? But this is a sequence of steps to express gradient of theta v pi of s in some particular form. It turns out that even if this doesn't look great, right? It's got some strange looking quantity over here. It turns out that this is a very useful form, okay? And we will, we will put it to use. But if you have any questions about these few steps here, right? How did you, how did we go from this to this? Is this actually true and so on? Ask, you're okay with this? Yeah. From this step to this step. So, this step, what, what is the quantity we have? We have a sum over actions. Uh, Let's just call this, um, okay, I'll, I'll just write this down here. I'm going to call that first thing just some f of s comma a. Okay, this s is uh, the same s on the LHS, okay, for which we are uh, calculating the thing, plus, um, the first time, right, what do we have? We have pi of s comma a sum over s prime okay, uh, yeah, is this correct? Yeah, so now I'm asking you to, um, so what was this LHS? LHS was gradient of uh, 
now let's try and describe what we have here in, um, in, in just sort of qualitative terms. So what we have inside this curly brace is, you have a sum over actions f of s a, and then you have, okay, if you want you can write this down as, uh, let's write it a little bit differently. Okay, now for each S prime, there is a gradient of V pi of S prime. What is the quantity multiplying that? The quantity multiplying that is a sum over actions pi of S A, T of S A S prime. What is multiplying this for each S prime? Pi of S A times T of S A S prime, right? Summed over actions. So what is pi of S A, T of S A S prime summed up over the actions? It is the probability of being at S prime, right? Had you started at S, so you are at S at time step, uh, let's say zero, you are taking actions according to, so maybe you can take three different actions. You will take this with probability pi of S A one, pi of S A two, pi of S, a3, right? Those are the probabilities with which you'll take these actions. Now, for each of these actions, there is multiple possible next states that can result because of stochasticity, right? What are these probabilities? These probabilities are basically T of S, this particular A, uh, S prime. So now, if you're looking at a particular state, S prime, if this is your S prime, what is the probability of being here? It is probability you took this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, okay. So this can be written as f of s a plus sum over s prime, I'm going to write, rewrite this as probability of being in s prime times this gradient of V pi of S prime. Okay, so this is what we see after uh, after just one step of expansion. Are you with me? So now imagine expanding this again. I mean, this is what we have now learned to expand, right? Gradient of V pi of S, we know how to expand. So expand this again. Again, now you'll get what? You'll get a sum over actions F of S prime a, right, and similarly, um, uh, you will uh, you you will get some similar probabilities multiplying s double primes. Now, if you look at for each state, right, how many times does this f of s a show up, right, multiplied by the corresponding coefficients? That's what it turns out to be. It turns out to be a sum over time of probability of reaching that state in t time steps. What keeps emitting is this f of s a, but then it keeps getting nested more and more and more, right? The corresponding probability will, will, be, will, will be that and that gets summed up. Okay, fine. Now we can, we can do some stuff with this. So I've just uh, rewritten it. This is actually called the Paulsey gradient theorem. Okay, uh, the gra that the gradient of j uh, okay, so we had written it generally for all states, but the particular state we are interested in is, remember, S0, right? So remember that J of theta is V pi of S0, and so if instead of general states, we, we, we write uh, S0 for our starting state, turns out that the gradient of J theta is sum over states, sum over time going from zero to infinity, probability of this times sum over actions times gradient of pi times Q pi of S A. Okay, notice that this is probability of being in state S if you start at time step uh, zero at state S zero, uh, okay, by following pi. Okay, now uh, we've not really done anything yet, but we will, the, the idea is we want to try and go up the gradient of, of this um, uh, J of theta, okay? We want to do theta nu is theta old plus alpha times this gradient, that's what we want to do. But what's the issue we have? The issue we have is what I've already told you we have, right? We don't know many of these things. We don't know 
this probability, right, or the sum of these probabilities, we don't know what is Q pi of S A. So although this is something we want to do, it is something we are not um, equipped to do. We, we, we are just, this is an agent interacting with the MDP, it doesn't know these quantities. So last time we were unable to do gradient ascent or gradient descent, what did we do? Sorry? Do stochastic gradient ascent, okay? So that is something we can do. So what's the meaning here? If we can't go up the actual gradient, right, we'll go up something whose expected value is the gradient, okay? And in order to do this, we are going to use the following uh, fact. For any discrete real valued random variable x with probability mass function p, the sum of all x, x times p of x is expectation of x. Okay, you've probably heard this 100 times written right to left. I mean, if I ask you what's the definition of expectation of uh, x, right? x is some random variable that takes a few values, um, right? You'll look at the probability with which it takes each value, right? Multiply it and then sum it up, right? So that, that's the usual way in which you, uh, you, you, you kind of know about expectation, but we will actually deliberately go in the opposite direction. That's what's going to help us over here. So. The idea is that every time we see something that's looking like this, right? It looks like a sum over the values that some random variable takes, a probability multiplying. Okay, this can also be f of x. Okay, so, I mean, this is expectation of x, but suppose I had to do expectation of some f of x, right? This, this instead of this x here, you'll have f of little x. Okay, that's the value, that's the meaning of expectation of some function of x. Uh, okay, so, so this is what we're going to use. Okay, I've, I've done quite a bit. There are only three or four moving parts, so it's, it's only understandable if you're a little bit um, wondering what's going on. So, the very high level thing we are trying to do is, we, are, we know that our policy is parameterized by parameters theta. If J of theta, this uh, goodness of this policy, right, expressed as the value of um, some particular starting state under that policy, we want to go up the gradient of this, okay, because that's a function we want to optimize. The policy gradient theorem, right, that we worked out gets us some way, right, in terms of simplifying, right, saying that you can in general express the gradient of any um, um, start, uh, for, for any starting state, the gradient of v pi is going to have this form, okay. Now, of course, this form is not directly something we can do anything with because it's got a Q value here, it's got some probability here which we don't know. Moreover, uh, if we want to do stochastic gradient ascent, right, if we want to do gradient ascent, we can't still do it. But it turns out that this particular form is convenient for doing stochastic gradient ascent. And uh, we are going to show how. And in order to show how, we are going to use this trick, okay, that everywhere we have this sum over some values a random variable takes we will replace it with the corresponding expectation. So normally you go right to left, but we'll go left to right. So you'll see this action in action right now. Okay, so here is the, uh, I mean, this, this slide and the next, right, the way we work this out is, is basically the, the key, I don't know, 10 minutes of this lecture. So here's what we do. We um, take pi, our policy, uh, parameterized by theta. We generate one full episode, right, based on this policy. If you want, you can generate more episodes, but you need to generate at least one full episode, okay? At time step zero, we are starting at this fixed start state S zero, taking action according to pi, and then the environment comes back with reward and next state, take again action according to pi. Keep doing this until at some point you'll terminate, okay? Uh, so this is where we've assumed it's episodic, so at some point this will uh, happen. Yeah, I was really in two minds while making these slides, should I leave this as T or should I change it to H or something like that? Remember T used to be the transition functions of your uh, MDP, this is not the same T, okay? This is like the number of uh, uh, time steps. Uh, I mean, this is, I don't know, more common, okay? So I just stuck with this, don't, 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 I don't know, alias it with uh, the transition probabilities. Uh, so you, you basically at the Tth time step, right, you realize that uh, you've, you've terminated, okay? So you've gathered data. And data is based on what we are trying to go and uh, uh, do our update. So how are we going to do it? Okay, so first step is just writing down again, I've written down the same thing from the previous slide of the policy gradient theorem. Okay, and now I'm going to start manipulating this. 
So the first manipulation is there's a sum over states and a sum over time. I'm going to replace that with just flipping it. Okay, it's a sum over time, sum over states. It's it's just changing the order of these uh, sums. It's nothing. Okay, it's, uh, it's it's just like a small rearrangement. Times whatever. So sum over times, sum over states. This times sum over actions times this. There are so many sums. But now, do you see the form that we saw on the previous slide? Do you see something being summed, right? Probability over that same thing, multiplying some function of that same thing. So I'll do the first one for you. So think about this. So keep this as it is, okay? Keep the sum over time, so fix t for, for, for whatever is inside over here. So what we have here is a sum over states, a probability distribution over states, right? So this is the probability of being in some particular uh, state at, uh, at time step t by following pi and so on. This is a probability distribution, right? Over, you'll have to be in some state at time step t. It, and it multiplies some function of state. That function happens to be sum over a gradient of pi of sa times q pi of sa, okay? But we have the form that we want. So using the, what was the trick from the previous slide, this sum, okay, of this whole thing, can be replaced by something if we are able to sample from this distribution, okay? And it turns out very conveniently that we do have samples from this distribution. So what is the, if you want to sample from this distribution which says what is the probability of being in a particular state at time step t by following pi starting at s naught. We did exactly that, right? We followed starting from s naught, we, we, we acted according to pi and we've done this for a certain number of time steps. And then it turns out, right, that this particular trajectory, we were at the teeth time step at state st, okay? So the st that we actually visited on our episode, right, is a sample drawn from this probability distribution, okay? Again, so this is saying, for each state, I'm gonna give a probability, and that probability is uh, the probability that you will be there in that state at the teeth time step if you start at s0 and follow pi. Okay, so now if, if, you, if you, I mean, you don't know this probability distribution, but you can certainly sample from it. So how do you sample from it? You start at S0, right? And you run lots and lots and lots of episodes if you so want. But on any given episode, if you look at the teeth time step, right, what you have? That is a sample from the distribution that, um, that you have over here. So, and uh, yeah, so if, if we qualify that behavior or whatever data is gathered by following pi, this pi basically says, this episode was generated according to pi. So had you gone in the opposite direction, you, you, this is how you would write it out, right? It is a sum over time, the expected value that, uh, expected value of this thing over here where the um, state is st, okay? It's the stamp sample that was actually, st is a random variable, okay? But then what values that, that, does that random variable take? It takes values, first state, second state, third state, and with what probability? With these probabilities, okay? So you've just gone in the opposite direction. Uh, okay, so far so good. Okay, now, uh, one thing becomes a little bit um, sort of practically convenient. We are not going to do the same step right now, but something uh, uh, just to make our life a little bit uh, uh, easier. So you could actually think of this as a sum over infinite time steps, okay? But then if you want in your mind, you can also think of an episodic task as actually an infinite sequence where beyond some point, all you have is that terminal state, right? You just stay at that terminal state and uh, you don't get any um, reward starting from there. So the point being made here is that this infinite sum can be replaced by a sum only up to the data that we have. Because beyond that point, right, any way the term that is being contributed is something like q pi of the terminal state, okay, for some action, which by uh, definition is zero. Okay, so let's just do ourselves the favor of not looking at what happens beyond termination because it's not going to calculate, it's not going to contribute anything to uh, this sum. If you, even if you do t equal to zero to infinity over here, right, you, you're, you're going to uh, basically be adding zeros beyond the terminal state. Right, so let's let's just keep it up to the terminal state and and uh, and calculate these uh, and, and some of these quantities that we have, where we have st over here. Okay, so we've we've sort of made partial progress now. 
we have um, sort of replaced this pesky probability over states, sum over states and so on. We still don't have full uh, um, ability yet to do stochastic gradient ascent because this is again now a quantity that depends on q pi, right, which we don't know. Uh, q pi st a needs that for all the actions and uh, so on. We can still make progress, so I'm just going to rewrite that same step, okay. This is what we had because I need some space. This is what we had after like three, four steps. Now, does it look like we have another sum to which we can use the same trick? We have the sum over time, yes, but we also have some over actions, right? Is there, a, is there a probability distribution over actions that we are familiar with? Yes, the policy itself. But do we have sum over A Pi of S A, the gradient outside, outside what? Yeah? Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, you, you can, but uh, yeah, you, it turns out you can, what you do is, is a little bit, uh, I mean, I know the next two, three steps to make this work, right? And that doesn't involve what you just said. You can do that if you want. Uh, okay, so if we don't have pi of S A over here, we bring it in, okay? So I'm multiplying, dividing now, okay? The same thing, I've not changed anything, right? Instead of just this gradient of pi times Q, I'm going to have pi of S T A times gradient of pi of S T A divided by pi of S T A times Q. Okay, I've just multiplied and divided by this thing over here. Okay, um, now it turns out we have this form. Okay, we have a sum over actions, a probability distribution over actions times function of actions. And because of the manipulation we did, this function now has this pi of STA in the denominator, which is okay, right? It's still a function. Um, and now, do we know a random variable that is sampled according to this pi of STA? A t itself, right? We were taking actions according to pi, right? So the particular, so let me write this down, right? So, I mean, I'm just keeping one expectation outside because uh, I mean, if you want, you can write another expectation inside. But A t, right, was drawn according to pi. And so if I now ask you what is the expected value of this whole thing over here, gradient of pi divided by pi times q for A t, right? You'll say, well, the probability with which every A occurs, right, multiplying this thing for that particular A, summed up. That's what we had earlier, and that's what we are now replacing by um, A T itself. Okay, it's the same thing that we did again. Are we good to go? We are almost good to go, but not good to go because the Q remains. Okay, but now to do something with the Q, you can do the same thing that you did. Uh, we did this, I think when we did uh, uh, T D, uh, linear T D, or just basically T D lambda or something like that, right? TD1, when we did the Monte Carlo method, gradient descent, linear TD1, we did it. What did we do? So you don't know Q pi of STAT, but do you have a sample of it somewhere? What is the sample of it that you have? What is Q pi of STAT? It's the expected long term reward you get by starting at ST, taking AT, and then acting according to pi. Have you ever started at ST, taken AT, and acted according to pi? exactly what we did, right? We've done all of these things before we started our derivation. We've gone through this trajectory, right? So if you start at ST, right, and then look at what is the long-term reward starting from there, right? That's going to be a sample of Q pi of ST AT. And uh, yeah, that's also called G T to T, right? And by the way, this is expectation of something multiplying something else, but these two things are independent. Okay, this Q pi of ST AT is, is sort of what you get starting from ST and going forward. It doesn't depend on things that have happened in the past. Um, okay, so now we have that Q of ST AT replaced by GT, uh, GT to uh, capital T, or GT to infinity if you want. Now are we good to go? We are good to go, okay, and this is what is called um, uh, reinforce. Okay, this is not called reinforce yet, but using this, um, um, whatever um, form, right, 
to do the stochastic gradient ascent is what is called reinforce. So again, what is now stochastic about this? When we wrote the policy gradient theorem, we had some probability here, some q pi over here and so on. And we just kept replacing the actual concrete um, forms here with expectations of some random variables in a mathematically correct way. We brought it all the way to a form where all the random variables involved are things that we, we have in hand, right? This gradient of pi is a function that, let's say we know what this, suppose it was a softmax, right? And for the softmax, I told you what is gradient of pi. So you, you will fill that out over here. Pi of st, at, you know, right? Because of the form you gave for pi, for pi. G, t to t, you know. You sum this up over all time step, right? Basically for all st, at. That is a random variable. The expected value of that random variable is the gradient of j of theta. Okay, so if you go down, go up whatever this thing over here instead of the gradient, you're doing stochastic gradient ascent instead of stochastic gradient, uh, so instead of proper gradient uh, uh, ascent. Um, yeah, and this is just one small, um, I mean, people write it down like this sometimes. So what we have here is gradient of pi divided by pi, right? That just mathematically happens to be gradient of log pi. Uh, okay, so yeah, it's just, um, Chain rule, right? This is chain rule, I think, right? Gradient of f of x is uh, gradient of f of x divided by f of x is gradient of log f of x. Uh, okay, so reinforce is the algorithm that will now start doing the gradient ascent based on this. Uh, this is again an old algorithm. It's due to um, Ronald Williams. Uh, again, the dependence on theta of pi is not being explicitly shown over here. So, and here's the algorithm. Okay. You, you start with some uh, uh, theta, okay, that's your initial starting point. Now you want to start going up the gradient, doing stochastic gradient ascent. In order to get the gradient, you need to run an entire episode, okay, and so you do that. You, according to pi theta, you, um, okay, in this case, actually, I'm showing the dependence on pi theta, to, to be clear. Uh, you generate the episode, and now, having generated the episode, you have to calculate the gradient, uh, or, a, or a sample of the gradient. So there, you have to um, you have to sort of do this sum over time. See, this thing itself has the sum over time, right? So what we are doing is we're summing up over time, multiplying the corresponding g t to t starting from there till the end, with something that depends on the state action pair at that time, right? So that's what we're doing here also, um, because we're going t equal to zero, one, two, three, right? You say the corresponding g for this time step is going to be. Um, the sum of the rewards starting at that t, right, all the way till the end of the episode. This is g t to t. Um, I'm not going to update the, so I'm, I'm going to do the whole gradient and then at the end of it, I'm going to have theta nu as my as my new one. Okay, but uh, just for writing code, I think I wrote it a slightly uh, differently. So theta nu becomes theta nu plus alpha times, alpha is the learning rate or the step size, this g times, gradient with respect to log pi theta, this is evaluated theta, okay? This, this gradient is not evaluated theta nu, it's evaluated at theta that we started out with, st, at, okay? So this is basically just a way of, um, of calculating the gradient there, and then saying that theta nu is theta old plus this summed up over all time, okay? Um, yeah, and this is, uh, I don't know, this is just like a, Fact, in case you're interested, why was this algorithm called reinforce? Frankly, I didn't know. I, I knew it, it was a slightly strange reason. Today I went and figured it out. So the uh, paper says that the basis of this update is that the reward increment is non-negative factor times offset reinforcement times characteristic eligibility. What is all this? We never heard all of these things, okay? This is the lingua franca of the 90s, okay? so. Reward increment is what is the increment we are doing based on everything that happened, okay? So it's, it's like saying, what, what are we adding to theta or something like that. So this whole quantity here is the reward increment. Now that, if you notice, is indeed a non-negative factor, also known as alpha, times the offset reinforcement, also known as the G, okay? That's, that's the actual uh, uh, reward, times the characteristic eligibility, okay? So this actually has some semantics. So in some sense, uh, see, this is a 90s paper. All of this terminology we're using right now, stochastic gradient ascent, right? So this kind of stuff is, is, is newer. So at that point of time, mathematically, Williams worked out 
how eligible is this particular state action pair for being updated okay and he basically worked out the formula of the policy gradient uh, thing and said this what a great gradient of log pi of stat is the amount of eligibility stat has so it's called the characteristic eligibility okay that becomes reinforced anyway that doesn't matter okay uh, the name doesn't matter but um, the algorithm certainly does um, yeah after you calculate the gradient inside of this for loop right you come out and uh, so you've updated the theta new to be the correct thing theta becomes theta new and then you keep um, you generate a new episode right do it again new episode do it again if you want right you can you can generate multiple episodes and then calculate the gradient over more episodes okay but you you have to generate at least one full episode you can't get the gradient by generating partial episode and so on because right the gradient is defined gradient itself has its expected value of the sum till the episode ends right if the episode doesn't end you're not allowed to stop this at 100 time step and say that's all i'm going to take the gradient right mathematically that's not correct you have to run the whole episode okay um yeah any uh, thoughts questions about this yeah yes absolutely yeah so softmax is a we just just did like a linear dot product of the theta and the features right and did softmax on that but your policy could be a neural network right where the it it the output depends on in a more non linear complex way on the input but is still differentiable okay even for a neural network right so long as you have differentiable uh, activation functions output is differentiable and you do the exactly the same thing so it's good you asked me that question because i think 2 um, 3 years back this is exactly the question i asked in the end semester paper um so i have an illustration you can i will give you that as a reference today yeah you'll do exactly the same you'll calculate the gradient of so see i mean uh, what did we start out by saying we want to be able to express the gradient with respect to theta uh, the gradient of j with respect to theta in in terms of the gradient of the policy itself right so so that's what we have done that's what the policy gradient theorem allows us to do and then here we are doing it with samples having done it right we can really apply this in any setup where so long as gradient of log pi is well defined it will be for a neural network if you set it up with softmax and sigmoids and all of that uh, you can you can go down the gradient go up the gradient okay um yeah actually i'll take a break is there any questions about any of this why did i not use this method <laughs> instead of sarsa policy search you're saying for uh, oh for the soccer that policy would have looked a little bit more like this it had if then else rules it had uh, really no form where i could i could be i don't know very certainly sort of differentiating the output the policy with respect to the input the sort of nature of the dependence was something highly implicit through various things right it it was not like you just run it through a neural network and the output comes out if you remember right the way it was parameterized it depends on what was some swing velocity Uh, the angle by which you're shifting to one side right the duration of something many of those are not even continuous variables right so it it, it was much more apt for black box optimization where nothing was assumed about the nature of this function here we can do policy gradient only if it looks like the blue line not if it looks like the red line good question so there are yeah i, I started out with examples right so in any of these things right you have a choice of different methods that you can um, you can use you don't have to use policy gradient the way eventually it it works out is there is some amount of intuition right about the number of parameters whether there is some rationale for saying that the output is the policy is differentiable with respect to the input and so on right and then you might apply it sometimes it might not work right whereas where policy search might work policy gradient might not i have enough personal experience with that happening in some cases it works okay and it might be more efficient than the uh, policy search so for example for learning motor skills right i think there's very strong evidence with the amount of empirical um, experience that people have gathered that policy gradient methods tend to work quite well uh, okay all right now um, let's finish up these add ons so to say 
Uh, first is called variance reduction. Now, um, I have again just written down the uh, policy gradient theorem, uh, I mean, which we already had uh, derived and so on. Now, I'm going to make a slightly surprising claim, okay. Now, let B be some function that just gives a number for every state, okay. It's, it's uh, mapping from states to numbers and it's some arbitrary function. Now, the claim I'm going to make is that gradient of J, which we wrote down like this, can equivalently be written down like this, okay. And what's happening? The only thing that's happening is instead of multiplying Q pi of S A, I'm multiplying Q pi of S A minus B of S. I mean, the reason this looks a little bit unbelievable is that um, I'm saying this is an arbitrary function of state, right? And how can you do that? And this will still be the gradient um, with respect to theta. It, it looks strange, but uh, I mean, one step of derivation will show you that it's not because uh, let's look at the quantity that we are subtracting out, okay? It is the sum over states, the sum over time, the P multiplying the sum over actions, the gradient times B of S. Okay, that's the quantity we are subtracting out. Now, uh, the innermost uh, sum, sum here is over actions, gradient of pi of S A times B of S. So, B of S does not depend on the sum over actions, right? So, you can take the B of S outside and then just leave this as sum over actions of gradient of pi of S A, but uh, what a sum of gradient is gradient of sum, right? So, you can write it as gradient of sum over actions pi of S A. Okay, but then we know that if you sum up the actions pi of S A, you get a 1. It's a probability distribution. So, gradient of constant is 0. So, the fact that, okay, so this is like a convoluted way of saying that this B of S does not depend on actions, right? It's a baseline that depends only on state, okay? And so, as so long as you have a function that only depends on state, you can subtract it out like this and you'll still have the um, uh, gradient, okay? That um, the, the formula doesn't change. The claim uh, remains the same. But why would you do this? Okay, you will do this for a for a very uh, legitimate reason. So that reason is that you could have high variance in these estimates of the gradient. So right, we're replacing uh, gradient descent, gradient ascent with stochastic gradient ascent. Right now, what if these samples of the gradient are very very noisy? The expected value is fine; it's unbiased, but it could have very high variance. Right. So in particular, imagine this kind of thing could happen in an MDP, okay? This is just my own illustration. So remember, what is the gradient? You're summing up over time. Um, you're summing up over time Q pi of SA times the gradient of log pi of STAT, right? So suppose you have an MDP where, I mean, you can sort of go off to one part of the state space or another part of the state space or yet another part of the state space, okay? This is what happens in general, let us say, uh, okay? There are about three modes in which you operate. Your start state is over here, but then after that, very soon, you live in this world or this world or this world. So, um, it could happen that in this first world, okay? Let's call this first world, second world, third world, that the Q values are all quite high, okay? So, S1 could be a state in which uh, the Q values for the three actions are 105, 79, and 100, right? Which means the V pi of S is 90. For S2, right, which is in this other world, it's it's close to like single digits, 10, 6, 13, etc. And the S3, right, kind of states are all ones where it's it's big negative. Now, truly, right, the V pi of um, um, the starting state, right, is going to be some average of these things, depending on the probability with which you go to these things, but if you just run one episode, right, or a small number of episodes, I mean, it's, you're going to get most of your gradient calculations either from this or from this or from this, right? So because of that, right, depending on where your luck to Q, right, you could get different um, uh, gradient estimates. So the most common thing that is done, right, is you subtract out a baseline from Q pi of S A, which is basically an L estimate of V pi of S, okay? We don't know what V pi of S is, but maybe there's some way of uh, uh, estimating it. If you have an estimate of V pi of S, then just run reinforce, and where we were just using G T to T, right, as the sample of um, Q pi of S A, subtract out V, v hat of um, S T, okay? Uh, this doesn't change the theory, right? We, we just saw that the, um, that the 
policy gradient theorem can be written out along with a baseline being subtracted that doesn't depend on actions, right? That's what we're doing over here. But the point is that this could have a lower, a lower variance than the original uh, just uh, update without any baseline subtraction. So this is called baseline subtraction. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is just a generalization of reinforce, but this is also done quite often in practice. Okay, on many tasks, um, you will want to subtract out a baseline. So where do you come up with this uh, baseline? Actor critic methods are maybe the most standard way of coming up with that baseline. Okay, so let's um, see what those are. Um, now, even if you fix, okay, so actor critic methods maybe are even one step more than just baseline subtraction. So even if you have like a fixed STAT, right here, what the claim I'm making is if you're in these states, you have high Q values, if you're in these states, mid, this, low Q values and so on, but even the same state action pair, right? Depending on the uh, MDP, how much noise there is, right? Could have fair amount of variance in uh, GT to T. So the idea of uh, actor critic method is to bring this down, okay, in some way. Now one way we could do it, right, instead of actually doing actor critic as it is, is to, um, is to just, instead of, um, so the, the standard, um, I mean, the way I had written the code, right, for reinforce is you do one episode, get the gradient out of this, right, and then go from theta old to theta new. But instead you can, you can run multiple episodes you can average out the gradient, right, over these things, right, and then do the update. That will certainly bring down the variance. This baseline subtraction will also bring down the variance, but how is actor critic method uh, going to do it? It's going to bootstrap. Okay, now, yeah, now, I think in the next few weeks, you'll keep, uh, you, you'll have these um, deja vu moments. Something we did, right, will come back. Uh, they just keep circulating, right? So, I mean, what are we doing? Remember what bootstrapping was, right? Instead of taking GT to T, the expected long-term reward, right, as the high variance, low bias, zero bias estimate, right? Instead of that, we do the bootstrapped, right, which is looking at the current estimate of ST plus one, adding that to the reward, uh, which is high bias, low variance, right? If you have an independent way of estimating V hat, right, you use this in place of GT to T. You lose the guarantee that it's, it's an unbiased estimate, but uh, there is still a little bit of theory that uh, holds. And this, right, doing it in this particular way, okay, this kind of update, if you're doing it, is what's called the actor critic approach. Okay, what's actor and critic? So it's as though your agent internally is two agents, okay? By the way, there is some evidence for this even in uh, animal brains and such. There is an actor part and a critic part. The actor part is in charge of the policy, okay, it is the thing that says I want to do this, I want to do that, and then this other part which is the critic, right, is the one that says this is the, I don't know, value or this is the probability of success of doing this, of doing that, right, it gives an estimate of the um, um, valuation, so to say, right, of the goodness of doing any of these actions. So here, our actor is the part of the agent that updates theta, right, and therefore implicitly the policy pi. The critic evaluates pi theta, okay? If theta is the policy that you're following, then you evaluate it maybe using um, uh, TD0, right? You can also evaluate it using other methods like batch reinforcement learning methods if you want, right? Um, which we'll see, uh, I think, maybe in the next class. Um, but so long as you have some independent way of estimating the value of some policy, right? So if you've been f following this particular policy pi, right, for like five, 10 episodes, right, you have some amount of data to estimate its value also, right? So that's what the critic will do. And then the critic will communicate that to the actor so as to do its update, right? The actor is in charge of the theta. So to do its update, the actor will now do instead of GT, right, it's gonna do this bootstrap estimate uh, times log theta, but then it's also doing a baseline subtraction to make it even less uh, variance. And this is beginning to look like what? This thing in blue is also known as what? Do you remember? Temporal difference prediction error. Okay, this is what we were doing when we were uh, doing TD0, right? We said the estimate of S, T, right, becomes that plus alpha times this, right? And this is called the temporal difference, uh, 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 temporal difference prediction uh, error. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be like this. In fact, 
this is um, not really always uh, guaranteed to converge even. So why do you think this is slightly problematic? What property did we need of, of this for the policy gradient theorem to hold? Yeah, this should not be biased. Okay, when it was GT to T, it was not biased, but now it is biased, right? So we are not doing proper stochastic gradient ascent. We are going up some gradient, which might be okay, but it might have some bias. Okay, that's not very good. But uh, there are uh, th there is a fair amount of understanding about these methods. There are other ways in which you can prove that they are actually uh, sound. In particular, okay, this is really getting beyond our uh, uh, current scope right now, but if you're estimating, let's say this V hat with a function approximator, there is a notion of what is called compatible function approximation for these actor critic methods. If the function approximator is somehow an analog of the way the policy itself is parameterized, right? So in particular, I think what happens is if, if the policy is softmax, where it is just doing a linear um, um, product of the theta vector with the, um, features being softmax with respect to that, then just linear function approximation using those same features, right, is compatible with that. In the sense that if you do compatible function approximation, right, you can actually show that uh, you'll end up doing proper gradient ascent. If you do any sort of arbitrary function approximation, you might not, okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's getting a little bit uh, too much, but this is something that's, that's done quite widely in uh, uh, practice. So there are a large number of uh, implementations of actor critic methods. Uh, do you remember some couple of weeks back, I told you about a course that uh, Harshad is thinking of offering. Harshad uh, Kadilkar who's joined us recently, right, is very likely going to teach a course on deep reinforcement learning. And he will cover probably, I don't know, 10 different variants of actor critic methods that have come up in the last um, few years. There is asynchronous actor critic. There is asynchronous something, something actor critic. Okay, there's A3C. There is proximal policy optimization. There is something called trust region policy optimization. There is something called DDPG, which you can use if you have uh, continuous actions. Um, yeah, there is something else with, uh, I think there's something called relative entropy policy search. There is like enough, okay. So the basic idea, what most of these things would be doing is taking this basic update, right? Um, either the reinforce update or a standard actor critic update and doing something more on top of it, okay? For example, they will add some other term, right? Like a loss uh, term to make sure that the policy is close enough to something else or the policy goes and explores more, things like that, okay? So you might come across some of these when you're um, um, reading a paper, let us say, but uh, you should know what is at the heart of them. At the heart of them is reinforce, okay? Reinforce really at the heart of every policy gradient method, um, actor critic methods um, also. But yeah, the actual technology has sort of moved past. It could very well be that on many practical problems, these will do much better than canonical reinforce, right? Because they, they, they probably deal with the variance issue better, right? For the particular ways in which the policy is parameterized, they might end up being better choices, okay? Uh, yeah, we are not going to cover any of this. Uh, <laughs> this is the last you'll hear from me about actor critic methods. Uh, we'll, we'll see a couple of examples maybe uh, downstream. But yeah, I'm not going to go through this list and explain all of these. Okay, so looks like we are uh, then done. What did we do today? We saw a very important family of methods for reinforcement learning called policy graded methods. Okay, they have large number of applications. They also have large number of variations now. But we saw the heart of it, right, is the policy gradient theorem, which gives rise to a particular form in which you can do stochastic gradient ascent. And the canonical algorithm is called reinforce. You can do baseline subtraction. You can also do actor critic methods to bring down the variance. So next week is yet another class of methods called uh, batch reinforcement learning. Okay, so see you on Friday to do that. My dear class, thank you very much.